Okay, um, this lecture sort of just falls into kind of the odds and ends category. Um, so we want to talk about um, a couple of different reactions. Um, Lilic and um, benzylic bromination. The haliform reaction. And alpha bromination of ketones. Okay, so let's start with lilic and benzylic bromination. You might recall from Chem 343, if you treat an alkene with bromine, you end up getting dibromide with the bromines adding anti to each other. Well, turns out that if you use dilute solution of dilute bromine and shine light on it, you can get a different product where it just adds one bromine. Now the tricky part is making sure that bromine is dilute enough to do this trick. And so eventually they've actually went ahead and designed a compound that makes sure that bromine is always dilute enough. And this compound is called NBS. So you shine light on an alkene with NBS present, what you end up doing is getting what's called allylic bromination. Now NBS is short for n bromo succinamide and it looks like this. And what it specializes in, in the slow release of Br2. Okay. Now, this reaction is a radical chain mechanism reaction. And the thing to remember about this reaction, in addition to being it a radical chain reaction, is that NBS is not clean. There's always a little bit of contaminant in it. You can open a fresh bottle of NBS and there would be a little bit of Br2 escaping. So NBS always has a bit of bromine present. Okay. So, how this reaction works. Is light has enough energy to break the bromine-bromine bond in half. And it splits it up into two. Each bromine gets an unpaired electron. This is the initiation step. And this only has to occur seldom. 
in order for this reaction to proceed. Now radicals like to do a couple different things. They like to add to pi bonds. They like to pull off H's and halogens. And they like to combine with other radicals. So in this reaction, we have our bromine radical. It finds a hydrogen, and it's going to take the hydrogen that would give the most stable radical. In this case, it's going to take this hydrogen right here, because when it does so, generate HBr, and this radical here, and this radical here happens to be resonance stabilized. Now each of these radicals then finds another molecule of bromine and it basically pulls off a bromine so if it reacts if this resin structure reacts with a bromine you end up getting this product if this resin structure reacts with a bromine get this product and you get both are possible. Now these last two steps are propagation steps. It's important to realize um, the propagation steps occur quite commonly. They take one radical and make a new one. The vast majority of the product is formed in a propagation step. Yes, you could form a product in a termination step. Termination step is where you take any two radicals and combine them together. Termination steps are very rare. That's because radicals are high energy intermediates. Chances of two high energy intermediates
surviving long enough to react are minuscule. So although termination steps do happen, a vast majority of the product is not formed this way. Now, you might note in this mechanism that we didn't use NBS at all. Where NBS comes into play is it's keeping the bromine concentration low. How it does that is because in this step right here, HBR is formed. What HBR does is that reacts with the NBS. And that generates BR2. So, the reaction consumes a little bit of BR2. That BR2 generates HBR. That HBR then goes and reacts with NBS to generate more BR2, which in turn reacts with a radical, generates a bromine radical that goes up and reacts with another. Um, um, out, um, hydrogen for more HBr, joining more H, um, Br2, and so on and so forth. And so it's keeping the supply of Br2 low because that supply is dependent on HBr that's being generated in the reaction. So it's a pretty neat system. All set at keeping Br2 at an absolute minimum. Now, due to resonance structures, allylic bromination, which is adding a bromine next to an alkene, often gives mixtures products. Benzylic bromination, where you put essentially a bromine adjacent to an aromatic ring, is much cleaner. Even though the radical has much more resonance structures than an allylic radical do, does, this position here is the benzylic carbon. That's where the radical is formed. And it has lots more resonance structures than the allylic case.
So it turns out only these two resonance structures react with the bromine. That's because if any other resonance structure reacts with the bromine, end up with a loss of benzene resonance. And this does not occur. So therefore, the only thing that happens is when the radical using the resonance structure with the benzene ring intact. That's the reactive structure. So, So allylic bromination typically gives multiple products. Unless the molecule is highly symmetric. such as maybe this molecule here. Benzylic bromination, much cleaner. And it doesn't even have to be benzene as the aromatic ring. You can also have pyridine or other aromatic rings as well. So, next reaction is called the haliform reaction. Basically, if you take a methyl ketone and treat it with base and bromine, you end up with a carboxylate and a haliform. In this case, if bromine is used, you end up with bromoform. If chlorine is used, you end up with chloroform. So, the way this reaction works is it's use base to take off an enolizable pro proton to form an enolate. This enolate 
then reacts with bromine. To generate this. Now, because of the inductive effect, this hydrogen right here is more acidic than the original hydrogen. So, base preferentially takes this proton off. And then this goes, swings down. And you add another bromine. And now this hydrogen is much more acidic than any of the other hydrogens, so base preferentially takes that proton off. And the resulting analyte reacts with bromine again. Now, there are no more acidic protons to take off. So what the base does is attacks the carbonyl. Now that O minus could swing down and kick the OH, OH off, that just sends the reaction backwards. Or now we have a carbon attached to three bromines. It can actually swing down and kick that off. It does so. end up with this. Now normally an O- minus can't kick a carbon off, but since this carbon is attached to three bromines, the inductive effect is stabilizing that carbanion, allowing it to be kicked off by an O-. minus. And then the C-, minus. what happens next is the fastest reaction in the entire sequence. And it's just an acid-base reaction between the carboxylic acid and that to give the carboxylate and bromoform. So what the haliform reaction is good for is it's a, another way of putting a carboxylic acid onto a benzene ring. But it's not a direct method of doing so. First thing to do is do a Friedel-Crafts reaction. And then treat this with these conditions, and that ends up giving you the carboxylate and bromoform, and then you can simply protonate the carboxylate, and then you have your carboxylic acid.
So this is actually a way of making deuterated chloroform. You can start with hexachloro acetone, which is dirt cheap, and add in D2O and a catalytic amount of NaOD. And once you start to get this chloroform, deuterated chloroform. And the other product is carbon dioxide. The mechanism of this, I'll leave for the problem set. Okay. The thing about this reaction is because this hydrogen is more acidic than the starting material. You cannot stop here. So this is just an intermediate. It will go on to get the carboxylate. There's no stopping it, at least not cleanly. So if you want to actually stop there, we have to use slightly different conditions. And instead of base, we have to use a weak acid like acetic acid. Since it is under acidic conditions, enolates are not used. Instead, enols are the nucleophiles. So the mechanism for this is first of all is a tautomerization reaction where we form the enol. Now, this acetate could take the blue hydrogen off. In that case, the reaction would just go backwards. Or it could take the red hydrogen off. In that case, the reaction goes forwards. So to figure out which hydrogen to take off, you really need to pay attention to which product you're going towards. Then once you have that enol, that enol reacts with bromine. And 
resulting bromide or acetate comes back. Takes that proton off. And you have your product. And this is a little bit slower to analyze than the starting material. And as a result, you can stop here. So it turns out this compound is pretty vers versatile with bromine, depending on what conditions we use. If we use bromine and a Lewis acid like FeBr3, we have electrophilic aromatic substitution. If we add bromine and acetic acid, weak acid, We end up with alpha bromination. If we use base and bromine, we end up getting a carboxylate. So, really have to pay attention to the conditions you're adding bromine to a molecule like this. That's all we have. Um, the rest of the semester is going to be looking at molecular orbital theory and concerted reactions, pericyclic reactions. And to kind of give you an idea of how cool some of these reactions are, this molecule right here is called bovaline. And if you take an NMR of, bro of bovaline, turns out there is just one signal in the proton NMR. And I personally think this is one of the coolest molecules ever designed, and no doubt about it. It was definitely designed to have just this one signal. And we will talk about this in context of um, a new set of reactions called paracyclic reactions, which are concerted reactions. And they really have their roots in molecular orbital theory. So we will have to talk about that on Friday.